It's about time because we're going there. Hi, friends. Welcome back to another episode of We're Going There in this special week that we get to unpack diet culture. I'm your host, Bianca Waters Oltoff, and join with me again is Leslie Schilling. Le- Leslie, thank you so much for being on the show and helping us find freedom with food. I am so glad to be here. Okay. So I love that you are okay with me asking a bunch of questions and coming in as a skeptic. Uh, If you are just joining the podcast, whether YouTube or on whatever podcast platform you're listening to, go back and check yesterday's episode where we started this entire series on diet culture, dismantling diet culture and making us aware of how diet culture has permeated every area of our lives and how really it could weigh on us. And so today I want to talk about that bodies are miracles, not math. So let's talk about, let, let, let's talk about the scale, friend, okay? So <laughs> most of us are familiar with the adage, age ain't nothing but a number. Well, today I'm going to rework that for the context of this episode and say that weight ain't nothing but a number. Uh, Leslie, talk right. to us about our issues with the scale. Gosh, we, and we, we have a lot of <laughs> all the numbers, right? But yeah, the scale. I mean, I remember one day in the sixth grade, my teacher put me on the scale in front of the whole class. And that was the first time I was like, oh, this number means something, but does it really? And so, yeah, we learn from a really early age. I mean, we see people doing that in schools, even though we know it can bring kids to harm. So yes, scale, the scale, the tracking, the apps, the everything, but we are obsessed with the number on the scale and it's perpetuated in the safe places. Like let's get your, let's get your weight right when you walk in the, in the office for a medical appointment. Um, it's, it's on some, some din- like when you go to the dentist, they're like height and weight, like as, as if that's necessary without anesthesia. <laughs> so, I mean, it's everywhere. And we've been taught our whole lives that a lower number is a better, more valuable number. And it is harming us. So you shared your scale story. My scale story is so embarrassing. Okay, so there was this uh, restaurant chain here in Southern California. I think it's actually, it might be across North America. There's this restaurant called Claim Jumper. Did you ever go to Claim Jumper? Uh, There's one in Vegas. Okay, okay. So back in the day, they would charge the child based on how much they weighed. And so there was this antique scale that had this huge circular face. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. It was this huge circular face. And I stepped on and the arrow went around. It was like one arrow led to a hundred. This was a scale only for kids. Most of the kids were under a hundred pounds. My arrow went around and halfway to the other side because I weighed 168 pounds at the age of 11. And I remember being mortified and everyone that was had their name waiting to enter into the restaurant was sitting in this area. And I got off the scale and I was mortified, mortified. So let's talk about weight centric training, because that's in the medical field, that's been the barometer for your height and weight. And then that determines if you're healthy, right? Is correct. If not, (laughs) it's not correct at all, but that's what we, that's what we do. It's quick and dirty, right? Quick and dirty. And we can, we can slap a diagnosis on it, which BMI, we will talk more about, but BMI body mass index was never meant to be used as a diagnostic tool at all, but we've built, we've built a lot on that. Um, But yeah, so weight centric training is a a body weight focus um, on health. Almost every physician I've ever encountered is trained weight centrically. I have a lot of wonderful physician friends and colleagues. Um, Dietitians are trained this way. Nurses are trained this way. Um, Physical therapists, like so many medical professionals are trained in a weight centric philosophy, which it aligns with diet culture, which is a lower number is a better number, which is so dangerous and so not true and does not take into account body diversity at all or genetics. So I now practice um, a weight neutral approach. And that is like, I'm aware that there are a lot of things we can do for our health that might never change the number on the scale, but it doesn't mean you're not moving towards health if that's what you want. And I- Great clarity. This is great because someone listening, because I'm listening and I'm like, but wait a minute, there is something to be said about health and, and a healthy body and taking care of our body. But what you said was so good because it brings clarity to the skeptic that, that there's other ways to determine what is, what is, what is the word healthy? 
Yeah. And that, and that's, that's even tricky, right? That's kind of a slippery word too, because healthy is, is we think healthy because of diet culture means thin or smaller bodied. Like, and that's not necessarily true. It's not what the evidence shows. Like plenty of people in a wide variety of bodies can have very normal lab work. That's a much better indicator of health than a number on the scale. And, and so health, like the number on the scale is not a proxy for health really at all. Um, but that we use it that way. Contrarian question. Yeah. Okay. So heart disease is the number one killer in North America. Heart disease is directly correlated to obesity. So somebody may have good like blood work, but if they're 300 pounds and, and, and it's very evident that it's, it's a lot for their body, it's putting strain on their heart. How do we reconcile that? Well, I think one thing to remember is correlation is not causation. So something can be correlated. You preached today. Say it again. Because it was nice. Sister. Correlation is not causation. And I will say the media loves to run with that and be like, I read this article and um, sitting down is as bad for you as blah, 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 blah. And we take a lot of things out of context. <laughs> so, and, and we we misinterpret research a lot in our world. So, but correlation is not causation. So if someone lives in a larger body, um, could they be at greater risk for certain diseases? Sure. Could it be because dieting, which they get most often when they're a larger person visit a doctor's office, they're going to get a recommendation to shrink their body in any form or fashion, even if it's disordered eating. Um, they're going to get a recommendation to diet. They might lose weight and then they gain it back and then they lose weight again. The diet yo-yo cycle increases your risk for cardiovascular concerns, for diabetes, for metabolic, any metabolic disorder. So what we're asking people to do by shrinking their bodies is making them more unhealthy over time. And then we blame it on them because it's their body size. And that is, it breaks my heart. I so preach where, in my office every day about it. <laughs> to go because okay so before we uh I, I feel like this is important i'm sharing personal stories because i feel like it's gonna resonate with somebody out there and i, I hope it i hope that's the case but um for so long i have felt okay i just have to diet more or i and then I, i'm like okay it's language it's lifestyle change whatever fad name we're gonna call it I have been on so many diets um, about two years ago. I really started praying because I felt intrinsically, I can't explain it other than I have felt I have damaged my body. I, I was going to doctors. I was like, there is something wrong with me. No matter how little I eat, no matter how much I run, no matter how many cardio classes and hit classes I'm doing, I cannot lose weight. And I was embarrassed. I was walking into church. I'm walking into conferences. I'm walking into family gatherings and like, People will look at me and think, well, clearly she doesn't take care of her body. And I just prayed that like my body would look like as healthy, air quotes, that I was because I'm eating a chicken breast and five ounces of broccoli. I'm measuring and scaling out my food. I am doing 60, 75, 90 minutes of exercise every single day. Why am I not losing weight? And I realized, and not just in speaking to you, but even just on this last two years of this health journey is like, I have abused my body so much and put my body through so many things, random pills from Mexico that made my heart race and my hair fall out, but I got skinny to Weight Watchers, to Nutrisystem, mm -hmm. to Atkins diet, diabolical diet of my life. Like it was horrible. It wreaked havoc on me internally. Yeah. I felt like I somehow did this to myself. And I'm listening to a trained professional say, yes, and you hurt yourself because of it. So I have, I have two questions. We have to move on, but two questions. Can I heal my body? And this goes to the next question is wholeness. And I want to take a look specifically that health is multifaceted. It's not just yeah. a number on a scale because I can look at my body right now. I've been on this two year journey and I'm, I'm happy that I've lost weight. But like, what's the, we'll get, we'll get, we'll get that to that in a second. But what I realized in taking a look at scripture is the beauty of holistic health, uh, like this yeah. multifaceted health. We did a series right. here at church 
And I really kept on driving to people like being made well, isn't one aspect because you can have an eight pack, but if your psyche is messed up, you're not healthy. You can have a broken heart and a big bank account, but guess what? You're not, you're not, you're not made whole. And so I would love for you to answer this question. Can we heal our bodies as we heal our minds? And can you explain that health is multifaceted? Yes. Can you heal your body? Yes. And not through dieting. So <laughs> you cannot heal your body through withholding nutrition from it. And that's what we do in dieting. And, and I just want to say to the person who's saying in their minds, what you just said, it's like, I've been on every diet. People are saying, all this is my fault. Diet culture taught your doctor, taught your dietitian. Like I used to practice this way, taught everybody that you must constantly be striving for a smaller body to achieve health. And what we've done is created so much disconnection right? Like disconnection with ourselves, with God, like when you're hungry, I mean, you're, I mean, you're hungry and you're counting every morsel, you're counting all your calories. I mean, it, it is unlikely that we have the mental space and capacity for connection, which is so important. So can you heal yourself? I think you can, you can't heal it through dieting. Um, and you can't, you, you have to be honest with yourself that it m might never result in weight change. And Ooh. that is that like, if you were sitting across from me in the office and like, I trained health professionals, I did a big talk for nurse practitioners. With, and, and I said, and I'm like, what if you said to your person sitting across from you, I care more about how you care for yourself than the number on the scale. So how do we take care of you now? Mm. And People would, well, first of all, they'd be very surprised. But second of all, they would, then we could get to what really matters. Food security. Does this person have enough food to begin with? We live in a country of excess, but there are a huge percentage of children go hungry in this country. And so like food insecurity, does this person have safe housing? Do they have access to healthcare? Do they have access to non-stigmatizing healthcare? Because if you're a person who lives in a larger body and every time you go to the doctor, you get a lecture, who wants to go to the health professional that shames you for living mm -hmm. in your body? Um, when our culture does that already, um, when we you know, safe housing can't access to moving our bodies. Like I am so fortunate. You and I live in like really sunny, lovely places. We're very fortunate. We also live in um, places that diet culture really loves like Las Vegas and, and Orange County. Um, I think we're uh, diet culture's favorites, but um, so we have, we have to think about that, but people um, need access to non-stigmatizing healthcare. We need to not be using the BMI. And what people don't really understand about health is when we're talking about reducing mortality risk, it's not about eating broccoli. It's about connection. And if we look at the, if we whoa, look at the- Whoa, wait, 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 wait. I know. Wait, you dropped a bomb and my soul feels like it's right, but we can't gloss over that. Can you, we, we, this is not the point of the episode, but that's too good to gloss over. So, well, and for our skeptic, like when I'm sitting in my office talking to clients and they're like, but isn't broccoli good for you? I'm like, yes, if you like it, but if you don't and you don't eat it your whole life, it doesn't mean you're going to be unhealthy. There's plenty of other things you could choose if you hate broccoli. Um, but so, and I would say like, who who are you connected with? Do you have safe relationships? Do you have people in your life that aren't going to be, Hey girl, did you lose weight? You're looking great. Right. And instead, like, are you going to have somebody that looks you in the face and says, I've really been thinking about you. Are you okay? Are you okay? You know, connections, connections to God, connection to people. When you look at mortality risk, um, studies, and I, this is documented in the book um, because for my skeptics, which I am as well, um, more, your connections, your relationships in life have higher impact on mortality risk than BMI, which doesn't mean any, anything to me. Um, smoking cessation, movement, your connection. So I'm asking if as a healthcare professional, do you have 
healthy connections in your life? And if you don't, how can we get you connected to a church where you feel you, you, if that's important to someone in my office and a lot of people know I'm a a faith-based dietitian, so they do. So how can we get you connected a place where you feel welcome and, and you feel good to just show up as yourself? And then how do we get you good relationships? Like, if you're, if you're scared to go out in the world because you've been shamed about your body, then we are harming people. Loneliness kills people. So relationships matter in terms of health more than Rock the BMI. Oh, okay. So this is the perfect place to segue. And let's talk about BMI. So there's a lot of letters in medicine. And one of my favorite things in life is to take big, large concepts and kind of deduce them down. And so BMI stands for body mass index. And the reason why I know this is because in my quest for uh, the perfect body, I've studied this and I've done, uh, you know, the, the in-body scales. I have right. done the water displacement. I've, I've literally have done it all. Okay. So One time I was talking to a dietitian about the ideal BMI and they gave me a range. And then I was talking to my best friend and she told me that her BMI was at 14. And I'm like, well, if her BMI is at 14, my BMI should be at 14. The doctor didn't even tell me my BMI should be at 14. I just said, if her BMI is at 14, my BMI is at 14. And I was so committed to this BMI and eating the chicken breast and the six ounces of broccoli and drinking water and nothing else and being painfully hungry with my one fourth apple and my eight almonds. Literally, I'm not kidding. Like this is what I ate. I put a post-it note and I put big Mm -hmm. black block letters, BMI, and then the number 14 with a percentage sign above my bed as my motivation. And then you wrecked my world. Well, one, that was a long time ago. And I think it should be noted that she was an Olympic athlete. <laughs> so why on earth am I trying to have the BMI of an Olympian? I don't know what's the so, problem. I have a question for you. So is that, so were you hunting for this BMI or for that body fat percent? I was hunting for her abs, which, you know what? Talk about, talk about body diversity. There's a photo and Brianna who listens to this podcast and we go to church together and she's been my best friend since we were 13. She showed me a picture of her in a two piece bathing suit. Um, They were playing in a pool. It's a photo of her and her sister. She's seven years old and she had a freaking six pack. So she was genetically predisposed to run in the Olympics and have a six pack. Girl, I got so much, I got so much jiggle over here. Like a six pack is not going to happen. I'm genetically pre uh, not disposed to have a, but I think, I think, uh, so all that to say, no, I, I didn't want the BMI. I wanted the abs and I thought I would have her abs if I got to that level of BMI. But, you know, I also realized that as I was losing BMI body mass index, uh, or bo- body weight, I was skipping my period. You're my right. hair was out, right. my skin was sagging and mm-hmm. I was painfully unhappy. Yeah. So I'm going to answer, I'm going to answer this two ways, two ways. Cause I've, so if you're, if you're hunting for, so body fat percentages are genetic, like you're, you know, I had a a therapist ask me one time, she's like, but what if I feel like I want to be here? And I'm like, you can feel one way and your body can be like, that's, that's nice, sweetheart. Here's what we've already decided for you. (laughs) So, you know, like genetics have already decided kind of like you're, predispositioned body fat percentage. And in terms of BMI, um, body mass index, it's really not an indicator of one health, muscularity, body composition at all, which is body fat percentage. Um, And it's really, really dangerous to, first of all, if we use BMI in children, which is just horribly, a a horrible measure that has caused more harm in my office than I've ever seen it be good. Um, It's so volatile because we're always, kids are always growing and they're like, they gain weight and they grow or they gain a lot of weight in puberty and people freak out, although it's super normal. That is one of the main triggers for people to end up in my office with disordered eating because somebody freaked out about puberty weight gain, which is so, so normal. Um, And then when we use the BMI, we, first of all, like my husband's Olympic style weightlifter. And he, we always joke about he's, he's, I'm using my air quotes, um, overweight, obese compared using the BMI chart. And so body mass index was developed by 
a Belgian mathematician, um, Adolf Quidelet, and he was just trying to figure out what the average white European soldier, uh, what their measurements were. It was never <laughs> meant to be used as a diagnostic tool, ever. So if you're not like soldier-esque European white dude, it means nothing. It means nothing. And we've... And then what we did is we took the BMI and we decided to adopt it as a medical tool, which it, it is a population tool, not an individual tool. So we adopted it. And then we had the really great idea to use the BMI to classify if people were in a normal or healthy weight range, which completely denies body diversity completely. Um, so there's the BMI part, and then there's this body fat percent. So if we're chasing things that are low, whether it be a BMI or a body fat percent, I will say when people chase numbers that low, like the one you were chasing, I would be looking to send you to eating disorder treatment. <gasps> be real honest. Numbers, chasing numbers that low, your hair fell, falling out no periods, even though you will have medical professionals say that just means you're working out really hard or you're eating great. It's normal to miss your period. It is absolutely not normal. It is common in diet culture, but it is absolutely not normal. And your very wise body is like, girl, we cannot support anything. We need to turn all that off. And so, so I would say like some of those numbers that you're talking about are so low in my office, we would be having the talk about a higher level of care. Mm. So this feels super vulnerable. And I, I know that we're going to talk about eating disorders and disordered eating, but looking back, reading, reading your book, having these discussions and looking back over the course of my life, I would have never have said I had an eating disorder right. because if you had an eating disorder, you were skinny. Like I wasn't skinny, so I didn't have an eating disorder. And of course there's the tried and true anorexia, bulimia. I didn't, I didn't, I would. I didn't have that, but mm -hmm. in the DSM five and taking a look at disordered eating, I'm realizing, um, it's been a stronghold in my life since the age of 12. Yeah. And I, when I talk about wanting freedom in this area, I, I want to go first and this feels super, it feels a little, <laughs> like a little hard to hear. Cause like, yeah. I want to love my body. She's yeah. done so good. She's she's done so good for me. And yeah. I feel like I've been so bad to her, you know, and I just want her to be healthy. Like I really, really yeah. long to be made whole. And yeah. when you were talking about BMI and I, forgive me if I'm jumping ahead, but I think that this is super interesting research. When you were talking about um, the insurance companies mm -hmm. and percentages of weight, can you, uh, this was revolutional for me. Uh, can you talk a little, was that BMI or was that a different indicator? Oh, that's what BMI. So yeah. So, BMI? Great. But let's yeah, talk it, about how, how this made its way into the medical field. So it was adopted because insurance companies had BMI tables, right? So to, to, to figure out what you were, um, what you were going to pay for life insurance. And so very popular insurance companies were already doing this and it was simply adopted by the medical community. And we would hope that that doesn't happen where the medical community is just like, that sounds cool. And it's not evidence-based, but that's, that's really what happened. And then we started classifying people as, um, and I'm using air quotes because I think the terms obese, obese and overweight are stigmatizing. And I don't believe they're evidence-based because um, the American Medical Association's charged a, a committee to do a deep dive into the literature to see if larger body size was in fact a disease. And their own committee came back and said, there is not enough evidence to say that the O words are a disease state and they decided to move forward anyway. And here we are almost 20 years later, making tons of money on making people think they need to shrink. Um, it is, it's really, really scary that that's how insidious diet culture is. And I want to jump back to your part. 
And I appreciate you sharing that. I think you are not alone. And I, what I want to say is having learned what I've learned in 20 plus years of practice is that I thought eating disorders were rare. I did not start out as an eating disorder specialist. I was like, I don't get that. I'm not, I'm just a sports dietitian. I'm not going to do that until some therapists schooled me and helped me unlearn some of those things. And what we know to be true now, and here's where anti-fat bias and diet culture and medicine gets in the way of someone getting an eating disorder diagnosis is the most, one of the most common eating disorders we see now is called air quotes, atypical anorexia. And that means somebody who just doesn't meet the low weight criteria. And I will tell you, I see Wait, what does that 80. mean? I don't know what Ati- that means. Atypical just means you're not, you, you don't, you're not like emaciated. You don't, you're not like clinically, medically underweight. So almost everybody I work with meets criteria for atypical anorexia, which just means oh. that you're restricted in a body that doesn't look super thin. And God. that is because of anti fat bias or, That's diet culture telling us you're not, you're not worthy of help. You haven't gotten there yet. And Mm. it's so dangerous, but I will tell you, it is really common. And there are plenty of people right now, um, getting treatment for that, which honestly, like if we want to talk about what that looks like, it it's, it's, you can't see an eating disorder. Like you can look at you, you can look at me no one would probably no one would ever know if we were suffering, but we're eating hardly anything. We have immense guilt. If we do, we might be over exercising. We might be purging. We might be using all kinds of drugs and other things just to get to this number that our culture told us would lead us to health, well-being, whatever. Um, very typical behaviors, skipping meals, um, ignoring hunger for like purposely ignoring hunger. Um, those types of things are disordered eating behaviors that we celebrate in our culture. So don't, I don't want a listener to think, oh my gosh, this is me. How did I not know? Because it's celebrated in our culture. And if, and you probably got a pat on the back for engaging in disordered eating behaviors at some point in your life. Mm. Probably. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I think we, we all have, right? Hey girl, have you lost weight? Yeah. That's what that is. Yeah. Cause it could be, you had a really bad stomach virus and that's not something to celebrate, right? <laughs> I mean, I think of that line in The Devil Wars Prada she, where she had yes. the flu and then it was celebrated. She's like, I'm only three pounds away from my ideal weight size. You know, I'm like, that was my favorite line because I resonated with that. You know, like how of tragic, course. how tragic to be like, I wish I could get the stomach flu just so I can lose a couple pounds. But like, uh, yeah, been there. Probably thought it, maybe not said it. Uh, yeah. So here's where I want I feel like we can spend a lot of time celebrating that our bodies are miracles and not just math. But uh, for somebody that is still struggling to find, well, what is my, what is, I'm using air quotes for our podcast listeners, but like, what is the healthy size I should be? And so for me now I'm like, okay, if I'm dismantling diet culture and I want to step into freedom, uh, and if I'm honest with you, I'd really love to wear like a bathing suit at my thinnest, at my thinnest. It was right after my wedding at my thinnest. I still felt so self-conscious that I wore like a granny bathing suit on my honeymoon. And I regret it because I should have been walking around in butt thong, you know, like I literally, like, I was like, dang, I look so good. And I, but yet, yet I felt so fat. I was so self-conscious. I was so insecure. So I'm like, what is the number that I'll be happy with? What's the number that I'll feel confident in? And I don't think it's a number, but how do I determine what is health? Is it a size 14? Is it a size four? Is it a size 18? Like, and, and then also, and this will be in the next episode, like we need to have, we need to have a come to Jesus conversation because I don't want this to be like reckless license for everyone to go out and eat right. ho-ho, ding dongs, flaming hot Cheetos and a gallon of ice cream. You know, there, there's responsibility here, but but for right now, as we wrap up this episode, like 
how do we begin to determine what is our body of health and our body of wholeness and our body of understanding multifaceted approach to health? I think first we have to come to grips with you, you may never be in the body that this culture promised you. And that there's a lot of grief there. There's body grief when you're like, but I did everything diet culture told me to do. And uh, I'm, that's still, that's my testimony. Mm -hmm, that's I'm my testimony. still not there, but it mm -hmm. promised me, mm -hmm. it promised me. Mm -hmm. And we have to check in. And the reason we're afraid to be in a larger body, because if we're real honest, we've been taught to judge them. We've been taught that they're wrong and that's false. And so if we, we have to come to grips with our own weight bias, what we learned growing up in diet culture, right? That, so how do you get there? And it's like, we have to table we have to table the number on the scale or the, or the, I have like four different sizes in my closet. I'm like, what? I mean, the, the clothing industry is out to like make us all crazy. Um, and they're oh, in cahoots with diet so culture. Zara's, uh, Zara's sizing is so jacked. The L is for little, not large. I'm affirmed to that. Okay. I am affirmed. I'm like, yeah, but, on but you know what? Take up space. And that's what, so what we need to be telling people is do not be afraid to take up space in this world. You were meant to take up space. And how do you know you're at the right health? I'm using my air quotes, the healthy weight for you. You're feeding yourself regularly and consistently. You're not skipping, skipping meals. You're not afraid of food unless you are medically allergic to something. You're moving your body in ways that make you feel so good that you have a body or you're moving yourself. Even if you hate moving it, you're like, I'm moving this body because it makes my mental health better. You know, like you are, you're, you're doing those things if you have an able body and that's something that you can do. It's not accessible to everyone. You're engaging in good relationships. You're not afraid to go out with your friend and celebrate their birthday and eat a piece of cake. And, and you're putting yourself in the bed and you're getting good sleep and whatever your weight is when you're there, that is your healthy weight. Ooh, ooh, there's some freedom. There's some freedom. Uh, I'm feeling very like H Harriet Tubman right now. Wade in the water. I'm over here in the river waiting for my freedom because I will, I will say this. Uh, at the end of yesterday's episode, uh, we did a test and I uh, failed miserably at like being a, a consumer of diet culture. And, you know, but today I feel like I'm listening to you. I'm moving my body every day, but I'm no longer killing myself with these insane workouts. Uh, right. Yesterday I did a Pilates class. Today I went a long walk with worship music. I'm in healthy relationships. I went to my best friend's uh, his son's ninja class just to be in community. I'm making good food choices. I mean, before this show, you raised up your banana. I raised up my protein shake. And we were like, cheers to not starving ourselves. <laughs> like I, I am on this journey. I feel like if I fail yesterday, his mercies are new every day. And sister, I'm doing, according to this evaluation, I'm doing much better. I hope that this conversation just sparks more interest, more conversations with loved ones. If this podcast and the messaging that you've been hearing has been a gift to you, consider it sharing with somebody who might be struggling in the same area. Maybe it's not you. Stay listening because it's going to give you language to understand those that wrestle with diet culture. And to clarify, diet culture doesn't affect those that are large and in charge. It affects everyone because there are people that will use this term skinny fat. There's people who will, even though they might be a size zero, they can't get their derriere and a pair of pants. Uh, nomenclature that we've used as negative, oh, she's thick, is now been appropriated now as that something good. Oh, I'm thick. How, wherever you land on that spectrum, you're invited to this conversation because the goal isn't thinness. The goal isn't a number on a scale. The goal is a holistic view, a multifaceted view of what is healthy. And if that includes relationships and broccoli, if that includes a walk and uh, at a protein shake, then whatever it is, a birthday cake, preferably funfetti, yes, Lord, then that is what we are after. Uh, Leslie, thank you for your wisdom. I cannot wait to dive into tomorrow's conversation. If you're enjoying the podcast, con consider subscribing to the show so you don't miss any content or leaving a positive review. Thank you, friends, for being part of this journey with us. We are so excited because this is the new beginning.